Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming tonight to our Coastal Community Resiliency. We're going to talk about economy tonight. And to get us started, Mayor Jim Hathaway. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. You know, uh, this is one, two, three, four, five, uh, six times now that we've been meeting here at the Brandon Center. Isn't that great? And we're getting there, folks. Uh, if you recall, back in January, we had a kickoff, and then uh, in February, we had our environment and cultural resources uh, discussion. In the 7th and in March, we were talking about, uh, or, or April, we were talking about growth and development. In April, we talked about social equity. In May, we talked about public safety. Tonight, we're talking about the economy. You know, I think it's great that so many of our great citizens of New Smyrna Beach have turned out, and I really thank you for doing so. And by doing so, you are participating in your government. You're allowing your elected officials to understand where we are going correctly and where we may need to make a little shift in, in our direction. So let me just say what a difference an experience tonight makes surrounded by our local businesses in the hands of this great showcase. Please take time to meet your local business people and thank you to the local businesses that have participated tonight. Each and every business supports our local economy by providing goods and services to our community and jobs to our residents. We have enthusiastic local business owners from all levels of ownership to speak with you tonight. And thank you all for coming out tonight and participating in our coastal community resiliency. We are collecting your comments and creating a strategic plan. As you can imagine, it is a large volume of information because we have had such a great turnout from our community. Keep engaging and sharing with our community to benefit all of us. And let me now introduce our elected officials who are with me tonight. I have Commissioner Judy Ryder back from uh, Tahiti. Judy, where are you? Thank you for being here tonight. I have Commissioner Jake Sachs. Commissioner Sachs, where are you this evening? Wave at the crowd. Okay, he's outside. Press him to play. Okay, okay, good deal. Commissioner Randy Hart is here tonight, Commissioner. We also have our city manager, Pam Brancasi, is here with us this evening, Sam. Thank you for being here. Holly Reshadar, our assistant city manager, is here with us tonight, Holly. I have Tony Adi, our CRA director, and by the way, Tony, our economic development director, too, as well. And we got today our new booklet out from the FRA, the Florida Redevelopment Association. Very nice new Smyrna did it again, of course, with our Cabby House development. So uh, thank you, Tony. Yes, Tony sir. served on the board of directors, by the way, of the FRA. So again, another plug for our great city of New Smyrna Beach. Mm -hmm. Who else am I missing here tonight? Oh, we have uh, Anna Hackett's here tonight, and we have Nancy Maddox here tonight for leisure services. Uh, am I missing any other appointed officials here tonight? Donna Banks is here. Donna, Donna Banks is here. Thank you, Donna. Anybody else that I might see? I want to recognize the former mayor, Mayor Adam Barrett, who's back in the back. Thank you, Adam, for being here tonight. He's one of our local business people who is serving at, on one of our uh, committees tonight to uh, explain what goes on here in our local economy. There are many candidates out there that are running for office, and I'm not going to name each and every one of you. You can certainly wave your hand and wave to the crowd and press the play tonight. I know that it's a great opportunity for you to come out and meet each other and, and to give your your positions on where you stand on, on, on both city, county, and state government. But at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Anna and let her give you some other details about tonight's meeting. So thank you all again for being here. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to go through um, our format tonight so everybody uh, understands how we are going to go about this. Uh, Tony Audie is going to give you an overview of the economy in New Smyrna Beach. Um, and then we're going to have a panel. Tony's going to lead them through a discussion. We're going to open it up to question and answer with the community. We're going to have a break where you can visit our local uh, businesses that have set up showcase here today. We're going to do a second panel in the same format. We're going to have a conversation with them and open question, question and answer. So you'll see these green cards on your table. Uh, if you have a question, write it down. I will be circulating throughout. I will pick them up. At any time throughout the evening, just raise the card up and I'll come grab it from you. If you need more cards, I'll have them on hand as well. And wanted to let you know a couple of things happening in the city as well. Next Thursday, the Tortugas game. We're going to celebrate. We're going to continue our celebration of our 250th anniversary. 
If you want more information about that, I pin that to the top of our Facebook page. So there's plenty of information right there. Tomorrow night, our Economic Development Advisory Board, which is a part of our economic, excuse me, our economic health here in East Myrtle Beach, is meeting. That's open to the public. It's in the Commission Chamber at City Hall. That's at six o'clock. And wanted to give you a heads up to start looking. Probably in the next three weeks, you're going to get an email and online opportunity to fill out a survey in anticipation of our next CCR. So just a little teaser there. If you have any questions about anything that's going on in the city, any information, please let me know. I'm happy to direct you to the right place. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tony Audi. Thank you, Anna. And again, welcome everyone. We are so glad you're here this evening to take time out of your busy schedule to participate in this important program. We, this is the sixth meeting of the Coastal Community Resiliency Workshop Series, and we're just so glad that the turnout we've had with citizens. I'm going to take just a, a few minutes to talk about the economy in New Smyrna Beach and economic development. What is exactly economic development and what our city program is? As the mayor said, we have an economic development plan that we will be revising. And your comments and questions are very helpful in that effort. And a big part of that economic development effort is our economic development advisory board. And there's several board members here tonight. If you would stand, please, and be recognized. Lillian Conrad is here right now. Chase Herbig is here. I want to thank you for participating on the board. So, and we also have a number of tools and partners to work with. So, um, we're just proud of our economic development program. So let's talk about our local economy. The largest sector that we have of jobs in the economy, and this is no surprise to anyone, is the sector of accommodations and food services. And everything I'm saying about our local economy and jobs can be found on the um, posters over there in the snack room, I'll call it. Um, the accommodations and food services sector has about 20% of our jobs, 2,110 jobs to be specific. The second largest sector of jobs in our city is retail trade. And we had a report several years ago that said that New Smyrna Beach, and this was in 2013 figures, New Smyrna Beach by far had the highest per capita retail sales of any place else in the county. And that, of course, is because we're the trade center for Southeast Volusia and because of our visitors and as well as our resident population. That's another 19%. So almost 40% of the jobs in the city are in those two sectors, accommodations and food services and retail trade. The third largest sector is healthcare and social assistance at 17%. So those three are up there with over 50% of our jobs. All the other sectors uh, fall way off. The next largest sector is only 7% with other services and education at 5%. And then 15 other sectors have the rest of the jobs. So when you're looking and profiling a local economy, that's the first thing you look at is where do people work? What jobs do you have? So who are the biggest job providers in the city? Those are the top five. Florida Hospital, New Smyrna with 700 these are round numbers, positions. The county school board at 335, the city with 263, Publix with 250, and Walmart with 207. The businesses that operate anywhere in the state, they have to register with their city. And we have registrations, these are separate business entities 
with 2,785 separate businesses operating in the city of East Myrna Beach. And that number has grown 17% in the last four years. That's a healthy number. The vast majority of businesses in New Smyrna Beach and Volusia County as a whole are small businesses. In fact, we have data from Volusia County that says 80% of all the businesses in the county have 10 employees or less. So let's talk about wages. Uh, at your table is a handout, a double-sided handout, that I'd like you to take a look at. The information on this handout came from one of our partners, the Volusia County Department of Economic Development, and we have a representative here, Virgil Kimball. That was his name. Thank you, Virgil. Um, if you go on the county's Department of Economic Development website, floridabusiness.org, and click on Economic Reports, and then click on Q Reports, you'll find these reports. And let's first look at this page, the private industry annual average wage trends. You see right away, Volusia County numbers are in blue. The average salary is of 2016, 36,558. Far below the state of Florida at 46,000, and the United States, the nation, is 53,000. So that's how we stack up against the state and the county. Turn the page over, another very interesting bar graph. The bar graph part of this are the number of businesses we have in these various sectors. So manufacturing, information, etc. The manufacturing sector hosts the highest average annual wage. Uh, close to 40,000. And those wages fall down that the, the lowest rated here in the 20,000 range or just slightly below leisure and hospitality. Well, as we just said, we, our economy, that's our biggest sector is accommodation and food services. So that's how we rank on wages, just speaking of averages. And some persons may say, well, yes, but the cost of living is less here. That's true. The cost of living in Volusia County is 9% lower than the national average cost of living. So that's a picture of our local economy in a comparison with the, the county and the state. Let's talk now about economic development. Now, what is that? It's an effort with programs and policies that's focused on two things, on job creation and on encouraging private business to make investments in the tax base. In other words, to get existing businesses to expand and to recruit new businesses and to help startups. Really those three things. So economic development efforts start with a plan where are you now, which we just talked about our local economy, and where do we want to be? And wherever we want to be has to start with our strengths. What are our strengths? You want to build on your strengths to get higher wage jobs. And economic development efforts include redevelopment. I don't know if you noticed, but during the mixer part before the program, we had slideshows of different properties that have been improved. Some of them have been improved with the help of CRA dollars. The CRA stands for Community Redevelopment Area or Community Redevelopment Agency. It's a program that's set out in state law in partnership with Volusia County. It identifies an area of the city, a particular area that meets the criteria for CRA program having distressed properties, uh, an inordinate amount of crime, an inordinate amount of uh, code enforcement violations, and it puts programs in place using a portion of city and county property tax dollars for programs to improve those properties. 
So we had a CRA from 1985 that ended in 2015. We're going to show those slides again here in a minute when we do another mixer to, to uh, visit the various tables here. And that, that program had a lot of success and it helped nurture the uh, redevelopment of Carroll Street and Flagler Avenue. Let's talk now about our plan and our city website. On our city website is our existing economic development plan, and some of the strengths there are uh, listed, and we have representatives here from the first one, our airport. Our airport, a recent study showed, has a $1 million impact on our economy. Uh, the two businesses here tonight are Airgate Aviation and the flights that are provided by Mike Smizer, and I think is here too. Um, and thank you for being here. Uh, the airport is uh, a, a great economic engine for us. It a, has a controlled power uh, there at the airport in a 5,000 foot runway, and it's surrounded by an industrial area with uh, a lot of really strong businesses, a flight school, a full service machine shop, and two composite manufacturers. Um, other strengths that we have for economic development are transportation system. US-1 is a strength that is, I think, sometimes overlooked. There are portions of US-1 that have a very strong vehicle count, 20,000 vehicles per day. Our education system, we have uh, Clarence McLeod with Daytona State here on campus on 10th Street is here. And along with our high school, both the high school and Daytona State are working on opening a construction and manufacturing skill area on campus. And we're uh, very pleased to hear that. We're also very blessed to have five accredited engineering programs within a two hour drive and two of those are in our county here at Daytona State and Emory Riddle. So that's something that's a real strength. Along with building with these strengths, we look at our tools. We have a no charge weekly commercial pre-application meeting and that's where people who are interested in starting a business in the city can come and talk to the review team, and talk to the fire marshal, the building official, the planners, uh, city engineering staff, and find out the steps necessary to get a business started in a, at a particular site. We also talk to business, or uh, excuse me, property owners about how to market their property for the best return. Uh, another tool that the city commission has provided for us are brownfield area designations where if there is contamination found on a piece of property in one of these designated brownfield areas like US-1, then that makes the property eligible for state incentives and mitigation programs. We have a voter approved city property tax exemption that uh, there's a business that uh, Virgil introduced us to that moved from another city to New Smyrna Beach, and uh, they manufacture aluminum staging materials, and they'll be hiring uh, 10 new positions in the next three years. We have uh, a lot of services from our partners, including SCORE. SCORE has a table over here, the service score of retired executives. They, for no charge, help businesses uh, get started and help small businesses move ahead and prosper. We also have the Small Business Development Center at Daytona State, and the another partner, the Southeast Volusia Visitors Bureau is here. So all of these partners help, they're part of what uh, we might call the economic development ecosystem to help our businesses expand and move forward. So it's a team sport with all of our partners, and we're, we're pleased to have them. The bottom line is, that I like to say <clears throat> that we're in a situation that some people might call coopetition. We want to cooperate with our uh, other existing uh, cities and counties, 
But until a business decides where they're going, we're in real competition to land a new business. If the business doesn't land in New Smyrna Beach, I want them to land in a neighboring city so that our residents have the opportunity to work there. We all win when that happens. And one of the exciting things that's happened is that our city commission and the city commissions in Edgewater and Oak Hill have all agreed to market our area, recognizing the opportunities we have with our location near Kennedy Space Center. You probably know from reading the paper that a lot of companies are moving to use the launch pads, leasing launch pads at Kennedy Space Center. And at the Space Center, right behind the visitor complex, is a 300-acre industrial park that some companies have moved into. One of those is Blue Origin. Blue Origin looked in Oak Hill at a 400-acre industrial site in Oak Hill before deciding to locate at the Kennedy Space Center Industrial Park. Their building is 17 acres under roof. That's the scale of these companies. And they have a lot of good jobs. That's the kind of thing we want to attract. In New Smyrna Beach, we have just a very small number of vacant industrial sites, and the largest one is probably six acres. We don't have anything on that scale. That's why it makes sense to partner with Edgewater and Oak Hill, who do have those assets. And we bring a lot to the table. We're well known internationally as a surfing location and known as a tourist destination. So we make a good partnership, and uh, the fourth member of that partnership who serves all three cities is the Southeast Volusia Chamber of Commerce, who also has a table here tonight. So those are some of the things that are happening here. Let's move on to our featured portion of this workshop and invite up to the chairs here four of our local business owners. And if you, the first four would come up, Adam Berenger, Jack Holcomb, Susan Ellis, and Dick Rosedale. If y'all would please come up to take a seat up here. And let's give them a warm welcome while we come up. everybody being here and thank you for asking me to speak on economic development. Uh, the three things that they had asked each one of the panelists to speak on was number one to give a brief uh, background of our business, give views of the business climate as we see it, and views on the future of a local economy. So I am the owner, uh, founder and owner of Sonapa Grill, as many of you have been there. Uh, our sales are down about 5% rusty because you left for a little while, but uh, glad to see that you're back. Uh, so, so Napa Grill, we specialize in wines from Sonoma County, Napa Valley, and we have a Northern California cuisine. We have been in business just over 10 years. Uh, at our current location, we have been in business for about seven years. Our sales have grown double digits almost every single day since we've opened. So the economy has really uh, I think as the economy grows, as tourism grows, so does our local businesses, especially on beach side. Uh, and again, we went from probably having originally in, when we were located in the public shopping center, we had about eight employees, and now we have 30 employees. And probably one of the most difficult things when we hear about, you know, we're talking about economic development, and I don't want to get off script here, but probably one of the most difficult things in New Smyrna Beach, especially on beach side, is finding good employees. And I, you can go to almost any restaurant or local bar and much of the retail uh, venues and you can see that they, there are so many help wanted. But that's, uh, that's, a, that's a discussion for another time. So that's pretty much what Sonapa Grill is. That's what our business model is. Uh, 
We are definitely dependent on tourism, especially located one block off the beach. And people continually ask, how's business, how's business? And I can tell you, business has been fantastic. This particular year for us, we're up probably 3% in sales. And I would say March was a really difficult month for us because there was so much inclement weather that we just didn't have the tourism that we typically have. And then especially going into May, we have two really big weekends in May, and that's Mother's Day and Memorial Day. And for Memorial Day, it was a complete washout. I mean, all that you saw on Channel 13 News was the storm that's coming, Alberto. And even though we didn't get a whole lot of rain here, it prevented a lot of people from coming over from Orlando, staying at their condos. Uh, so we really are dependent on tourism. Uh, our sales for that particular weekend were down close to 20%. So the business, business climate, I think here in New Smyrna Beach, I think it's a very vibrant business climate. I think that there have been many changes in the 10 years that we have been in business. And I look back and I think at some of the pricing and what we could charge for a glass of wine at the restaurant and what people are willing to pay. And then here we are 10 years later and you go into the garlic and they're selling a glass of wine for $20 for a glass and people are buying it. The people that are coming over here and that are spending time in their condos or that are buying houses, it is, when Tony mentioned that it's inexpensive by 9% to live in Volusia County, I don't think they were talking about Beachside in New Smyrna Beach. I can tell you that. Because I really think that it's changed. And it also goes back to, I don't think we see as many families living on Beachside as we did in the past. It's just expensive. I would say that you really average house is probably about half a million dollars on each side. There may be some that are less expensive, but then you gotta remodel them. Again, those are, those are discussions for another time. Uh, looking at the business climate moving forward, I think that we have great opportunity moving forward. I think some of the things as mayor, when we created the economic development plan, we were in a very difficult time. 2009 was a very difficult time. And then going into 2010, we had the construction industry was decimated, mortgage industry, I mean, goes on and on to places like Home Depot that aren't selling appliances for homes. Right? So the economy was, we were in a bad, very bad position, and that was statewide. One of the things that I wish we looked for, looked or spent more time on was to prepare for being successful. Because the city commission, the city staff followed the economic development plan. And I gotta tell you that it's successful. If we did not do, if we didn't build another house in New Smyrna Beach, if we did nothing, people from Orlando are going to come over here. Orlando is the fastest growing city in the country. Those people are gonna make their way to our beach. We, it's, we have a beautiful beach, we have a beautiful waterway. They're gonna make their way here. What the future needs to be is the infrastructure. And how are we gonna move people in and out of the city? And I think those are the biggest questions that are really gonna uh, face the city commissions in the future. Parking uh, and moving people in and out of the city. And it takes economic development to be able to pay for those. One last thing, and I know I'm probably going over my five minutes. Another thing that I started as a business was the NSB Wine Fest, which the last time that I was in this room, we had over 250 wines from pretty much Napa and Sonoma that we had to sample with a lot of great food. Mark Madison had his band here. I thought, man, if we could just get 300 people to come to the first wine fest, we had to stop selling online sales at 400, and then we sold another 77 at the door. So my biggest pet peeve with myself was the fact that we didn't find an extra $5 million to make this bigger because the wine fest would have been much bigger. <laughs> I'm Jack Holton. Thank you, Adam, for that. Um, Adam and I go back uh, quite a ways. That economic development uh, board that he was talking about when he ran for mayor, he explained to me that uh, that's great, I'll run for mayor, but I'm going to call you. And when he got elected, he called me and he said, I'm not taking no, you're going to sit on this board, you're going to help us, we're going to figure things out, and we're going to, we're going to try to solve problems um, and maybe look at things a little differently. 
Uh, as you all know, I own New Summer Chrysler Jeep Dodge, New Summer Chevrolet. Um, both used to be located on US 1. I owned one property, I leased the other the way we bought it. Um, we decided to move out to uh, 44. Uh, Chevy was easy because the lease expired. The building really was, it didn't suit us for what we were doing, for where our industry was going, and basically to take care of our customers. So we moved out to 44, and my plan was to see how that went. And it went pretty good. We were up 30% from US 1 to 44. But what the building did and the facility was allow me to become more efficient. Uh, I, could, I could get my customers through the door uh, faster out. You guys value your time and you've told me that. So I just said, I want to get in and get out. And that's what I focused on, to build a store. So then I thought, you know, I'm going to stay on US 1. I, I spent a lot of money building these things. I think that project there was about 11 and a half, 12 million dollars. And then, um, and we're putting you know, furniture and equipment in, you're, 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 just, you're just south of, of 15 million. So then I was going to build the Chrysler store, and I had a hundred engineered plans. I was going to redesign on US 1. It was done. I had a sign sealed set of engineered plans that spent $160,000 for. And I kept looking at my financial statement and my sales on 44, and I kept looking at the, my, my customer satisfaction scores were rising too because of how the building and the technology allowed me to take care of my customers better. The, the experience was better. I'm sure you all bought cars and you'll disagree with me, but it, it really was. So, <clears throat> looking at it, I had to come to the conclusion of, do I walk away from this $160,000 investment, especially I told all the commissioners, hey, I'm staying on US 1, I'm only going to build a Chevy. And I sat in there and I kept looking at it and I, I came to the conclusion, do I want to make a $160,000 mistake or do I want to make a $7 million mistake? To build it there, to remodel, to end up with an inferior product was going to cost me roughly $7 million. So I just sat there and kept looking at it, and it's one of those things you know what the right thing to do is. You just got to kind of talk yourself into doing it, and it was a big loss. Uh, I wasn't, I'm not excited about kind of throwing that money away. So lo and behold, we move, we buy a piece of property, and we move the Chrysler store out there, and sure, you know, instantly we're up 30%. Um, I grow my employees, uh, and we do roughly, this year we're trending between the two stores, do just south of 175 million in sales. I've got 140 full-time employees. I've got roughly 50 to 60 uh, part-time vendors, people that work for the store that are, that are uh, outsourced. Um, we have a 401k, we have healthcare benefits, and I, roughly, I have just, just south of, uh, well, just south of eight million the way we're going right now. So it's between seven and eight million dollar payroll. When you break that down, um, dollars per employee, I'm just south of 60,000. And one of the things for me that was always frustrating when Adam asked me to be on the board, if you remember, Tony was talking about that um, voter passed tax abatement program that they had. So I sat on the board that kind of built that little uh, the, the little uh, score sheet. And Tony will sit there, and, and my biggest frustration has always been people don't really understand all the facts. We deal with a lot of noise, and, and we, we get ourselves really worked up, but we do it with without the facts. And, and for me, uh, the hard part was I sat in that room and they all told me this is a great idea. And you just saw the sheet, was it 53,000 for the, the government or for the United States, it's 40 something for the Volusia County and it's 36,000 uh, as, it, as it comes down, right? So I'm sitting in a room and they go through it and they figure all the things that they want to have, capital investment, uh, amount of jobs, uh, medium income, do you, are you 100%, 120%, 150% of the medium income? So they kept coming up with a scorecard, and investment, 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 jobs, jobs, jobs. And then at the end they said, uh, but we want to make sure we get these special jobs. I go, what are the special jobs? And they were you know, labeled as uh, high skilled, um, you know, medical, uh, you know, just, just label, just, they sat there and they kept talking and talking and talking, and I kept getting frustrated and frustrated. So, as, as it went on, I said, okay, I go, do you guys agree that you love your score sheet? Yes, we love our score sheet. I said, okay, let's start there. Let's do this. Let's take my business, because your, your constituents or the people that are here in town, they don't care what the label is of the business that provides the check and the benefits. They want the check. Because you've got to understand something. I look around this room, basically our population in New Summer Beach is 60% under 60 years old. 
for 65, I think it is, and 35% above 60 years old. So we, we need jobs in this town because 65% of us, I'm sure you all have grandkids or you all have relatives that are younger that, that need a job, and I'm sure you all came from a community that provided a job for you to get here. And you would, you would have never hope that someone would stop that journey for you to allow yourself to come to what we all refer to as heaven as New Smyrna Beach. So as we went through it and we scored my business, I, I maxed it out. It was the first time I ever got 100 in my life. Okay, so I was proud of that. And what I understood there is I couldn't believe that I had to explain what my business actually was. And I worked hard. I, I, you know, I came in, and I, I didn't have a rich dad that left me a business. Um, I was in the Navy for three years. I worked my way up through as a salesman, a sales manager. I took opportunities and grew with them. Uh, I take pride in the fact that in, 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 in my stores, we have an average employee of about seven years, seven, eight years. So I don't have high turnover. Uh, I, I value my employees very much. Um, my customers, you'll notice if you come into either store, my, my office is in a glass booth right on the showroom floor. There's no hiding from me. If there's a problem, I want to know about it. I'm invested in my business, but I'm also invested in my community. So why am I here? I've got everything. I'm out 44, my business is up 30%, everything's good. I'm here because there's, what I see in our community, because you speak to uh, economic development, and you speak to, and I've been to a lot of the meetings, what I see us doing is mixing issues and problems. There's a lot of smart people in this room. There's a lot of smart people in this town. We have issues. Not gonna dispute that one bit. Sticking our head in the sand, and running from these or ignoring these issues are not going to solve our traffic problems. They're not going to buy us the, the synchronized lights to get people in and out of the beach. They're not going to help the Magnolia folks that have speeders going up and down and driving like maniacs and the Magnolia drag strip. They're not going to help our, my, my nephew, just to give you a little bit of insight into the police department, the reason I always refer to that. My nephew was a 10 year police officer here. They trained him, he was a canine officer, canine officer of the state of Florida, won the award, loved what he did. Lovely. So he sits down with me and says, Uncle Jack, he goes, I just, I, I'm, I'm looking at where this thing leads to. I just don't see myself getting the life that I want to live. I don't see myself being able to achieve what I want. I've got a wife, I've got a son, I want to grow a family. And I said, well, you know, I'm not, I don't ever want to tell you to change careers, but I'm going to tell you what the opportunity is. And I'm not going to give it to you, you're going to have to earn it. So there's no guarantees, there's no certainty. So he came there and, and, and basically within a year and a half through training, he's in my service lane, he's one of my service riders, he's making more than he was as a 10-year police officer, as a canine officer, getting extra pay. He didn't leave because he didn't want to be a police officer, he didn't leave because he hated the police force. He loved it. He left because he didn't see himself getting to where he wanted to be. That doesn't mean that's, that, that, that was right or wrong, it just was to, to have that conversation. And, and attracting these people is going to take a wage that's going to cost us money. We want to be protected properly. We want to have the services that we need. We've got to make the investment. So here's where we're at. We have to look at growth and we have to figure it out. So how do you figure it out? I listen to people tell me, well, 44, when you develop it, it can be great things, it can do so much there. Well, people ask me, how, how hard is it to get a business up? Right now, I'm not sure if I decided to move both of the dealerships from US-1 244, it would get approved. I've been here 20 years, raised my son, daughter, the, my daughter's moving back, we bought a piece of property on Corbin Park, we're gonna build a house. My son-in-law works in Daytona, my daughter works in Daytona. My son's in North Carolina right now. So, you know, I'd love to have them come back. They don't wanna be in dad's business. So if you're all sitting there going, well, you, you gotta take care of it. Well, they don't wanna work for me. They just don't want to deal with that. So, we've gotta figure out we have 60% of the, like I said, or 65% of the people in this town, and like 45% of them engaged in the workforce, how to keep growing and, and doing it right. And there's gonna be some tough decisions made, and you, but, but, but doing nothing isn't gonna solve the problem. If you think you're gonna do nothing, and you're gonna stop every business from coming into town and make it difficult, and your traffic problems go away, you're sadly mistaken. If you think you're gonna have to pay, be able to pay a fair wage, to your police officers, it ain't gonna happen. If you wanna solve the problem on Magnolia, it isn't gonna happen. That doesn't mean we strip away the community and just have everybody bulldoze the place and we go build it. I like the fact that we 
are looking at um, uh, landscaping out on 44. I would just hope we could walk and shoot gum at the same time and we could put that in and keep moving down the road. I think that's a good thing. That's engagement. We want to make it look right. We want to let it look beautiful. Your commission put more pressure on me to make sure that I put special oak trees and tall trees and bushes. And I never went to a meeting where they all didn't beat me up and tell me that's what I needed to do. And, you know, it was, it was, I liked it because I'm friends with all of them. They didn't cut me a break. They didn't give me a deal. They told me this is what we expect. And we, they wanted a higher standard for me. Now, I'm sure everybody, there's the naysayers out there. That's not true. You're all in it together. That's not the case. I serve on the UC board. I have a 5013C in town that's raised just south of 500,000 that we put 100% of the dollars in the youth in this community. We buy them bats, we buy them balls, we send kids to, to camps, we, we provide equipment for people. We do everything we can. This community has done it, it's, it's, it's rewarded me unbelievably. I feel obligated to be here tonight, to have this conversation, which maybe isn't the popular conversation right now. But I don't want to be here in five to ten years and we're trying to figure out how to get ourselves out of time out because we didn't prepare right. So I, I would just I would just tell you all to tap the brake a little bit because there's a lot of good things going on in this town. We worked hard from 2008, 2009 to get here. Let me tell you, you know, I, I came here in 2000, 11 months later, or that it was, we had 9-11. You know, that was, that was terrifying, and then all of a sudden in 2008, remember, I went to Chrysler store in a Chevy store. That was, I, I sat there for, you know, two or three days waiting for a FedEx truck to come see whether I was going to be in business and my 140 to 150 employees were going to have jobs. That, let me tell you something. If you think you want to throw up, that, the wait for that FedEx truck to go by and it doesn't have your letter, that's the worst feeling I've ever had in my life. So when the city came to me, I understood. I've seen, I've seen great times. I've seen... Lots of great things, growth, money, wonderful things. I've seen tough times. Somewhere in there, we've got to we've got to step up as a community. We've got to challenge this area. We've got to make it the best place, but we've got to be able to move it forward. Because if we sit here and we allow it just to stay stagnant, we will pay a price five, ten, fifteen years down the road. So I appreciate you, your time. I appreciate the city asking me to speak. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be here. And if there's anything I can ever do for any of you, I would do it. I appreciate all the people in the town that do the things that they do, from the Chamber of Commerce to the city employees to the police to the commissioners. Uh, I, I just say, let's let's be better than than we are right now. Let's figure out a way to get this growth done right. So thank you. I got to stand up. No cushions here. Uh, <laughs> I was asked to speak about Canal Street in the historic district, which is pretty dear to me. Uh, I've been a real estate broker for 43 years, and my wife and I lived in Winter Park. We had a beach house here, so we were over during the weekends when our daughter was very young. And one day, 37 years ago, this summer, I decided to take a walk down Canal Street. I started down uh, near Sands, and I walked mostly down the middle of the street. Um, I was taken by the Chamber of Commerce building, the Utilities Commission building, which was a bank, and some of the old structures. I ventured into a real estate office on Sam's and there walked into the Kara, K-A-R-R-E-R, -E -R, real estate office. The Kara apartments still exist over here. Those of you who've been around for a while knew Alice and um, Gertrude Kerr. They were two uh, elderly maids who owned a lot of property, the, the likes of Bouchelle and Hannah Monet. Uh, when I walked in the office, the lights were not on, the air conditioning was on, not on. This is the property that Mike Brewer now owns. And there were two ladies, one at one desk, the other at the other desk, and they were dozing. Um, Alice had all these investment uh, brochures, gold, silver, etc. I walked in and I kind of just uh, waited a few minutes. Long story short, uh, uh, they both woke up. I spoke to Gertrude and I said, I'm from Winter Park. I'm kind of enthralled with the downtown because nobody wanted to be downtown. And uh, I own properties, I still own properties in the Orange County area. And that market had gotten just too spicy. 
And I mentioned I'd be interested in some of these properties, especially the ones that are in need of uh, repair. I like those kind of properties. Uh, the idea is to buy what nobody else wants when nobody else wants it. Uh, and uh, right at the, and I left. Uh, about two weeks ago, she called me, said she had a property. She was, uh, gave me a description of it, said it was a two-story. Uh, said it uh, was in a downtown near her office across the street. And I, uh, I thought to myself, when, when I asked what it was listed for, she told me, I said, oh, Jesus, I don't even know if I want to come over. This is going to be a, a real disaster. Uh, I came over, and uh, the property was at uh, 114, 116, which is the two-story next to the uh, Terry and, and Richard England's sculpture place. Um, I bought that 37 years ago in December. The, uh, the AT&T Phone Center was downstairs. Upstairs had never been remodeled. It was housing for the railroad workers, etc. Um, I was there in 81. In 85, we started talking about establishing uh, Main Street, applying for Main Street. Uh, Mike Brewer, Jerry Sapp, and myself seeded the initial funds. Mike uh, did the legal work gratis to apply to Tallahassee to become a Main Street USA. We were subsequently successful at doing that, and we became a, uh, a Main Street USA, which gave us the ability to use tax incremental dollars to fund the CRA. And there are people in this room jumping ahead because I purchased additional properties in 84, 87, 89, and uh, uh, subsequently up to, up to 2015 when I bought the old movie theater. There are people in this room including Adam, um, the current mayor, Jim Hathaway, Judy Riker, um, and I'm probably missing some others that were involved when we would use the funding that you could apply for the grants. One of the reasons that Canal Street came back as a, a vital downtown area is that those that took advantage of the grants were able to dress up their facades, paint their buildings, do awnings, uh, meet certain criteria, and it was very successful for those that took advantage of it. Um, going back to Adam and, and uh, uh, Judy, who was the only other one I see here, um, the last of the funds were uh, put to use for three major products, uh, projects. Of course, one was a penny saver, which is now the cork, and um, Dr. Stevenson's building, the old Babcock building, and I was fortunate enough to find out about it through Mark Monison. I was up in North Carolina during the summer and uh, that there was some money left. And I had to go through quite an effort because I was not a designated site. The reason the J&J building is it caught the corner of uh, Canal in Orange is because of the belief with Tony and Adam and the, the group to approve. I had to jump through some hoops because I was not considered a designated um, beneficiary was able to apply for that. Uh, if it wasn't for the CRA, that particular building, uh, one of several, but uh, would be a, still a dirt, a dirt parking lot next to Time Mango, which is uh, you know, one of the buildings. So um, jumping ahead, the CRA was a big factor in getting this area of downtown, the historic district, uh, where it is today. I can tell you now that from 87, over the years, I've seen the ups and downs of Canal Street. There was, during the recession, it was kind of a joke if you lost my cell phone number, just drive up Canal Street in 500, 400, 100 block and uh, look for my, look for my, phone, my four rent signs sitting in the window. Uh, I can tell you that I would hear uh, nobody wanted to be downtown. When the regional center went out, there were some people that sprung up, ran out there, and found themselves in some financial straits because of the, uh, the cost of going to that new type of construction with the CAM, common area maintenance. The one thing that Canal can provide and does to this day, in my opinion, is a niche market for those that want to be in a historic district between the office and the retail, because we can rent, I'm speaking for myself, at a lesser figure than what, you could, what you're going to have to pay to go out to a, a, a regional center where we still have our historic uh, significance and uh, uh, I can tell you also that over the years, in the early years, it was not always the easy to get a really good tenant. I went through some 
uh, situations where you would take somebody, you were a little reluctant, but you needed to make a mortgage payment back then. Uh, today, it is absolutely the, the best that I have ever seen uh, with quality tenants that many of you patronize on the street. Um, I jump ahead because I use an example of the enthusiasm. I'm hearing from more and more people of how they want to be on Canal Street. It used to be nobody wanted to be on Canal Street. Now I'm hearing people say, and I'm not here to sell uh, a, a product, but I'm hearing more and more positive things about the street. Um, and, and as I see Mark Monison. Mark has probably been one of the biggest volunteers uh, over the street with the merchant many, many years ago. And you'll still see him floating around and supporting the, the merchants uh, that, are, that are in the area. Um, the, um, when I bought the old movie theater and involved in a remodel on that, um, I finally got to see over to the upstairs where it has some nice executive offices. I'm pleased to say, in a fairly short time, of 11 executive suites served by a, a, an elevator, seven have been rented. And the reason I'm, I wouldn't even mention that is because sitting over here at the middle table is Freddie and Tara. Kling, K-L-I-N-G, the, they walked into the building uh, yesterday and uh, took the elevator upstairs and heard that my office is across the street behind a half wall, which is one of our tenants there, and uh, uh, said, we want 206. And I said, what do you do? Yes, we went up there, we heard about it, and they are the new mortgage brokers that will be on the street. Point being that people are coming to, to Canal Street and looking. Uh, storefronts don't stay vacant very often. And uh, I'm enthused. Uh, hopefully, in Jack being in the an interest sensitive business, I get the Fed just uh, doesn't uh, do us any harm over the next uh, year or so. And we continue to have the quality of people we have. This is the most uh, enthusiastic I have ever seen merchants that rent from owners that pay the owner a rent so they can pay their taxes, their insurance, their mortgages, et cetera. There's more enthusiasm with the tenants than I've ever seen in the uh, 37 years that we've been in property downtown. And I thank all the people that helped it, from the CRA and the commission and all. And I obviously didn't get into the, the uh, situation that we're all facing here with the growth. Why the office to just speak about Canal Street? So, Thank you for your time. Uh, they had stolen a little bit of my thunder here. Um, I, I was beginning with the, uh, in 2006 and seven there was a housing boom, and in 2008 the recession hit Florida hard. It was especially bad in Volusia County, one of the areas that ranked highest in the nation for foreclosures. In 2010, unemployment numbers in Volusia County were 12.8, compared to the rest of the, na the national average of 9.8. In New Smyrna Beach, the economy suffered. About one-third of Canal Street was empty. Businesses closed, properties were put up for sale or rent. The downtown took a beating. At the 2008 Florida Mayor's Convention, the idea of bringing art and artists to depressed areas was talked about. Cities desperate to get rid of blight made empty buildings available to artists, allowing breaks on regulations and restrictions, and in some cases, they even gave buildings to art groups. <laughs> there was some success Figures show that by investing in the arts and artists, a community receives a return of $7 million on a $1 million investment. In 2012, Sally Mackay, Susan Stern, and I opened an art space on Canal Street, the Hub on Canal, right in downtown with empty buildings up and down the street. Our goal was to help bring Canal Street back to life to put feet on the street and have lights on at night. We wanted to join with the other merchants on Canal Street and the Canal Street Historic District, the CSHD, who had been working so hard to preserve this unique, delightful downtown. 
We wanted to offer studio space for artists to work and our community a place to create, learn, and come together. We collected a whopping $23,000 from our friends, some of whom still remain our friends, um, uh, our neighbors and the community. There were detractors and skeptics, but we gained community support, artist support, and government support, both city and county. With Tony Otte's encouragement, we secured a three-year rental assistance grant from the CRA and signed a three-year lease on 11,000 square feet at 132 Canal Street. We now own that building. Since opening in 2012, we have welcomed over 200,000 visitors to the hub. We have sold over $785,000 worth of art, representing the work of more than 180 Central Florida artists. The Hub on Canal is open seven days a week and hosts over 60 events per year, and we have over 600 members. In the last three years, we have taught more than 2,800 classes and workshops for children and adults on everything from conversational French to building robots. The Hub networks with whenever they can, with ACA, Arts on Douglas, uh, the Artist Workshop, the CSHD, the City, anything to keep costs down and keep visitors coming. Canal Street and the Arts District are growing a national and international reputation, and we are well known throughout Central Florida. Every time you come downtown, you strengthen our local economy. You help to keep the town alive and well, strong enough to be sustainable, strong enough to be unique. And it is you that wants to keep our town the way it is, to retain its unique charm and sense of history. And so far, there has been real progress. There is a life and energy on Canal Street that cannot be denied. Restaurants, galleries, and businesses have opened. We have the Brandon Center, we have the Tabby Houses, the Utilities Building has had an amazing facelift. Terry Jane England is soon to begin construction on Jane's, a fabulous studio and gallery at the corner of Magnolia and Downing Streets. The CSHD is more organized than ever in their efforts to design offerings that will encompass the businesses along Canal Street. We are working to promote our emerging arts district. This energy, this commitment is essential to the identity and sustainability of New Smyrna Beach. Our historic downtown is open for business and must remain so. It is the heartbeat of our city. The economic resurgence that has been achieved in the last eight years underscores the importance of being deliberate, of protecting our old buildings, of the importance of art and neighborhood being the focal point of New Smyrna Beach, of the vital importance of good business practices and networking. If New Smyrna Beach wants to have a healthy and sustainable future, we all have to commit to it. Everyone needs to be involved in the running of our city. Everyone needs to help sustain and protect our local economy. Thank you. So we just have uh, just four comment cards that I picked up and going to read, they're not directed towards anyone in particular, so if somebody wants to comment. First on how much positive or negative impact does the Volusia County Commission have on our economic development? Anyone want to take that? Read the question again. How much does the Volusia County <laughs> Commission have on our New Smart Beach economic development? Right, it was. So my thought as mayor is we have in my own opinion, we have the number one city in all of the 16 cities within Volusia County. So when, 
When economic development, we decided to get involved with Team Volusia, which was uh, partially funded by the cities and also by Volusia County. And Volusia County really looked at that as their avenue for economic development. Uh, we were involved because, in, again, I thought, and I think the commission at the time thought, no matter where a business locates in Volusia County, those people are going to find their way to our beach. They're going to find their way to downtown Canal Street. They're going to find their way to Flagler. So I think the more that Volusia County does to promote economic development, those people are going to find their way to the best beach, the best city in New Smyrna. That is New Smyrna. And I think when someone relocates a business and then they come and visit New Smyrna Beach, this is the place that they want to live. This is a place that they want to buy a house. So I think as Volusia County embraces economic development, it only benefits our city. Okay, so if any, any one of the panel wanted to respond to this, it was just a comment that said, uh, bumper sticker, welcome to MSB, now go home. Any, any business owners, anyone want to respond to that? Or just... Move on. What are businesses doing to support their employees finding affordable housing? Where does your weight staff live? Yeah, I, said, I would say that's the that's one of the number one issues that that we're seeing. Uh, I know that Jack has a different demographic for his employees, but it's it's definitely within the restaurant industry. It's very difficult uh, for our employees to find a place to live. Most of our, I would say, there's a a good percentage of our employees, it's a first time job. So they're still living at home, they're still living with their parents, but it's those few employees that are actually in college, that are living on their own, and they usually have a roommate or two roommates, and I'm asking them, where are you living? And it's not New Smyrna Beach. It's, they're living in Port Orange, or they're living in Edgewater. So it's, it's certainly something that I think that the city and that's the city, I mean, it's, the city doesn't build the affordable housing, but it's definitely something that the city can use. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and again, one of the, again, as these projects come, you, you really, I don't know a whole lot about them. You start to research, you start to stick your head down and look and find out what it means. So there's an apartment complex going across the street on 44, I think it's got 500 uh, apartments, gated community. I mean, first, I mean, look at this place, it's pretty first class. Accommodations. As I started to talk to my employees, what do you guys think of this? Tell me what you think. And I, I was, it was amazing how many of them said, man, it would be nice to walk to work. It would actually be, you know, we rent, like Adam was saying, a board orange, or we rent, I think the rentals are going to be somewhere around $1,100 or $1,700. Gated community, social uh, building, pool, barbecue center, I mean, a lot of really nice things. And they liked the idea, and I said, well, I could finally use my sidewalks that I had to build, so you guys could use them a lot faster for it. But I was surprised at the number. Like, it was a big number. Like, it wasn't a couple here and there. I, I was talking maybe 20, 25 people said, for my business, that would be, because I'd show them the pictures, what do you think? I was, I was blown away by it. Like, I was like, I was, okay, you kind of go if I want to come. Once my employees told me this is a benefit to us, you know, we wouldn't have to drive to work, we could just walk across the street. It really woke me up to um, uh, what, you know, what's going on. And then you take these, you know, I've got some millennials that work for me. They don't want to be tied down. They don't want a mortgage. And, you know, I, I sit in these study groups with all the manufacturers and the cars and figuring out where these millennials are going to buy, what their interests are. You know the common thing that comes out of every one of those meetings? Nobody knows. There's no loyalty. <laughs> They're, they don't. They, they, they don't want to put their, their anchor down. They don't want to do anything. So they love this type of housing because they can go in. There's not a lawn to mow. There's. It's just easy living. I pay rent. I get utilities, whatever it is, and then then we move down the road. So that kind of caught me off guard because I thought I was better prepared for that, and I thought I knew what my people needed. But that was interesting. It's a benefit to us. So that, that's my two cents. So we have just one more question. A, a few more questions came in. I just want to let you know that if you submitted a question, we don't get to it because we are running um, on a schedule here. Your question will be answered and posted online on our resource page like we've done every other meeting. Uh, we're going to take a break after this question. You can ask questions directly of our panelists. 
Um, and if your contact information is on here, we will respond to you directly as well. Okay, so just want to let you know that we are answering every single question that's been asked. Just want to have to do it live. So, last question How about offering a discount card for locals? Do we have any, any kind of local program? Any comments on discount card for locals? You Jack, all don't do you, pay get, do you get a discount? I, 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 I like a discount. discount. That, I don't know where you're all from, but everybody that comes to my place, they all want one common thing, and it's discount. So <laughs> I've, I've yet to meet the person that goes, I'm good with the price. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm already doing that. <laughs> no, that, that's interesting because when we began the economic development plan, that was something that came up sort of, uh, I think it, in the plan as I was looking at it today, going back through, it was something of a hospitality card. I think that we had talked about it. I just don't know if you would have to get so many of the businesses to agree to it. And I don't know if Tony's been out working on that. Tony? You want to address this one? Well, I was going to say, and maybe uh, Sue Williams or somebody from the Canal Street group could help, but I know the Canal Street Historic District did look into a, there was a program uh, the gold card or something like that that I think is still in existence. So there is a program out there, I just don't know how well known it is. The high school has a food card. Mm -hmm. high school so, has a food card. It probably is a fundraiser, like a twenty dollar card you can yeah, buy for a kid on another, a sports team. That's another one. That's yeah. those things are out there. So let's have a round of applause for our panel please. <laughs>
are one of the members that have the most profile. We have 13 entrepreneurs with profiles on that site. It's great for networking and great for sales. So we'll hear from Chris in just a minute. We also have uh, Joe Zitka, who is the owner of Airgate Aviation. And Joe has a table over here. Chris's table is over here against this wall. And we're also going to hear from Stan Harrison, who has a State Farm Agency on Magnolia. So let's give panel number two a round of applause. Hi, my name is Chris Boyle. I'm the owner and brewer of New Summer Beach Brewing Company, located at 143 Canal Street. I like to think that I have the best job in the world. I get to ride my bike to work and make beer. Uh, so a little backstory. Um, we're very proud to be the first microbrewery here in New Smyrna Beach. We've been serving up tasty brews for over four and a half years. I was a home brewer for six years uh, before we opened the brewery. I was perfecting my craft in the garage and sharing my creations with close friends and family. It wasn't until after serving my beers at two friends' weddings and receiving great feedback that my wife and I decided to take our life savings and open a brewery. We chose New Smyrna Beach because it was our hometown and we wanted to contribute to the diversity of New Smyrna Beach with a microbrewery and tap room where locals and visitors could socialize over a handcrafted pint. Uh, in 2013, we secured a location for our business at 112 Sands Avenue, and at that time, I believe there were over 14 vacancies on Canal Street. Uh, so my wife was pretty nervous that we were taking our life savings and starting a brewery in the downtown area. Um, we opened our doors to the public on January 11th of 2014, and boy, was our town thirsty. Um, ever since that day, we could barely keep up with the demand, and we quickly knew that we needed to expand. In 2016, our landlord, Michael Brewer, offered us a much larger location, which was a blessing because at that time, uh, Canal Street was booming, and there were no other options for us on the street. Um, our new location at 143 Canal Street opened its doors on June 17, 2017. Uh, it's three times the size of our original location, and we produce four times the beer at that location. Um, and we now employ three full-time employees and two part-time, uh, not including myself. And needless to say, we've been successful, and our local economy is very strong, and I can attribute that to three major factors. New Smyrna Beach's culture, location, and the bi-local movement. Culture. New Smyrna Beach has an awesome, relaxed, small beach town vibe. A beach you can drive on, the most consistent surf on the East Coast. You can ride your bike almost anywhere, cruise the streets on a golf cart. There's boating, paddleboarding, kayaking, and fishing on our inland waterways, where you can enjoy unique restaurants and shops that independent entrepreneurs have established, adding to New Smyrna Beach's culture. And I can't emphasize enough how big a role our independent entrepreneurs play in our culture. There are also many events that take place in New Smyrna Beach that draw thousands of visitors. Uh, there's the Seaside Fiesta, Flamenco Follies, Images, Art Fiesta, and many more. Location. Our location is strong, or our location, our local economy is very strong, partly due to our location. Uh, we have the beach, the inland waterway. We're only an hour from Orlando, 20 minutes from Daytona. Those seeking to leave the hustle and bustle of Orlando have a quick drive to New Smyrna Beach for a relaxing day or weekend. Another huge plus is the fact that we have three international airports right near us that allow easy access to New Smyrna Beach for those traveling a greater distance to get a little taste of our paradise. It's also convenient for those who live in New Smyrna Beach to commute to Orlando, Titusville, or other areas offering higher paying jobs. The buy local movement has really had a huge impact on my business and our local economy. Recently, consumers have been seeking unique establishments that offer not only the goods or services they desire, but also a local experience. Our shops and restaurants offer that experience. For example, an Outback Steakhouse doesn't have a tree house to dine in like Norwood's. A Sunny's Barbecue doesn't have a back patio to enjoy live music on the weekends like Yellow Dog Eats. Nothing beats a dinner at JB's while the sun sets over the river. And let's not forget about some fine shopping experiences like the Posh Pineapple, NSB Outfitters, or learning to paddleboard with Paddleboard New Smyrna. New Smyrna Beach Brewing Company offers the unique experience of an open brewery concept 
and social taproom with handcrafted ales and lagers suited for the beach lifestyle. In our taproom, patrons can enjoy brews inspired by our town, Coronado Beach Cream Ale, Disappearing Island Apricot, Old Fort Coffee Stout, Canal Street Wheat, Turtle Mound Double Brown Ale, Inland Amber, and of course, the famous Shark Attack IPA. Our local economy will continue to strengthen and grow as long as we keep to our core values, a relaxed, small beach town with unique, independent businesses and restaurants. That means buying local, lower density development, and fighting to keep generic stores and restaurants from moving in, and some more parking would definitely help. That being said, I love the way our town's growing, and we do have a very strong economy. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm a transplant, I've been here for 18 years, and I really would like to see some smart growth and not quick decisions. Traffic obviously is an issue, but it also means money in a lot of our pockets. Thank you. I'm Joe Zitzka, I'm the owner and president of Area Aviation. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Thank the uh, city for inviting me here to speak. So, Airgate has been around since 2002, um, started in Sanford with one aircraft and has grown, moved over here a few years ago. We do, uh, we do more than just fly back and forth to the islands. We operate an FBO on the field, so we service third-party aircraft that come in, fuel, amenities for pilots, take care of them, and we run a charter service that flies over the Bahamas, uh, down to Cuba, and other charters around the U.S. We also have a maintenance facility, provide uh, third-party maintenance, and uh, take care of our own fleet. And I acquired an avionics shop earlier this year, so we've started to expand our business. Um, Chris did a, a great job of describing all the amenities that we have here in New Smyrna. And having grown up here, this is a fantastic place to be. Uh, I, when I got out of school, out of high school here, I went off to college and went to work as an attorney and spent 20 years as an international tax attorney. Um, I've traveled to a number of places all over the world and worked with clients in 13 different countries for 20 years and jumped at the opportunity to come back here and raise my kids here and have a business here and be part of the community. I think there's a lot of opportunity here in New Smyrna for continued smart, sustained growth. Uh, I think it requires things like these sessions that we've had throughout the year and growing in a strategic way. One of the issues we deal with is finding good quality talent to come in and, and we have a range of jobs that require high skill and high education and the amenities that New Smyrna offers help us attract good quality talent. My, uh, my views on the business climate are positive. Uh, we continue to invest in our business and to grow our business with the expectation that as the community grows, we can continue to service everybody. We, uh, for example, we started this morning off uh, operating about 10 aircraft, and I think by the end of the day, we had 13. Um, we also have added three new mechanics in just the last two days. So we continue to invest in the community with, uh, with the expectation that, uh, that we'll be here for a long time and grow as the community grows. Well, it's already been said. Thanks to the city. Thanks to you all. Um, this is a absolutely wonderful opportunity just to be able to address you guys. Um, I'm very humbled by it. So thank you again. Uh, thank you guys for hanging in there with us because we know it's been a long day. Um, fortunately, I'm the last one that you guys have to hear from. But hopefully... I give you something. I believe economic development is rooted in a couple words. That is value added. Um, the speakers that spoke to you today already pretty much mentioned the same thing. Planning, growth, development. And I'm just gonna add a couple words. That's value added. Um, my great grandmother told me one time, she says, when you wrestle with pigs, you get mud on you. And the pig likes it. So I say that just as a little bit of, of an icebreaker because my name is Stan Harrison. I'm the State Farm agent here in New Smyrna Beach right off of Magnolia Street. So many of you and I have had 
several contacts with each other, whether it be a hurricane, a uh, vehicle crash, a house fire, or the failing health of one of your loved ones. Um, I have the fortune of being the guy that you call. So when Ray Parker Jr. made the song, Who Are You Gonna Call? Most of you use my phone number, which I'm blessed to be able to uh, respond in a timely fashion. So when we talk about economic development, from an insurance perspective, I am that guy. Um, I can't begin to tell you the number of billions that what I do on a daily basis adds to the local economy. Uh, every auto repair shop, uh, the auto dealers that have already addressed you, the business owners, the homeowners, Home Depot, you name it, everyone is touched by some of the work that we do in our office. Uh, I pride myself in my office as being the number one office in terms of value at, and that is emotional intelligence and also understanding your needs and to compare that and relate that to the policy that you have. Now, it is June 19th, right? Right. right. All right, now I've gone to a couple of these meetings so we're going to liven this thing up just a little bit, all right? It's June 19th, right? Yes. All right, thank you. So it's 19 days past our official opening day of hurricane season. So we're going to try to add some value to this meeting, all right? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you guys three things. You can write them down, or if you have that photographic memory, um, so be it. So I'm going to give you something that I, I think each of us can benefit from. The number one thing that I would say is pay attention to your declaration page on your either homeowner insurance policy or your renter's insurance policy. Here's why I say that. When the storm comes, you guys won't be able to reach me because my phone is ringing off the hook. Touch me now. If you do not know how to read your declaration page, I will read it for you, free of charge. My office is right around the corner. I do this for anybody. It's not in, what was the term you used? Cooperation. Cooperation. It's just a, it's a matter of you guys knowing what you have. Sometimes you have an absolute wonderful policy. It's just a matter of understanding what that is. Last year, could not believe the number of people that had a policy that was cheaper and they did not have wind coverage. Check your policies for wind coverage. That's the number one thing I will tell you to do. Verify that you have wind coverage on your policies. Um, I used to be the executive director for the insurance department in Oklahoma a few years ago prior to coming here to New Smyrna. And one of the statements on one of my agent's offices was, insurance is not meant to be cheap, ladies and gentlemen. Insurance, I'll say that again, insurance is not meant to be cheap. It is meant to be there when you need us most. And guess when that is? At all times. Because you never know when that person, I was gonna say something else, but when that person backs into you as you are picking up your items from our local grocery store, and you have that ding in your car, and you want somebody to address your immediate needs. Or if something should happen, like another storm, because we are in that cycle now, where we're expecting a number of storms this year. That's number one. Everybody got that written down? All right, value added number two. Check your auto insurance policy declaration page. Make sure you have this thing called comprehensive coverage, okay? Next to it should have a number that's called your deductible. Most policies, or if you have a really good policy, has zero deductible. Because here's what we've learned. Hurricane Matthew was a primary wind event. Hurricane Irma was a primary water event. And we don't want to even talk about what happened in Houston and Louisiana a number of years ago. But folks, we had a tremendous amount of snow that fell in the United States. That water is coming our way. Okay? So be prepared. And I mentioned that Irma was a primary water event because we totally lost nearly 125,000 automobiles in the state of Florida alone. And when salt water gets into your vehicle, it's no longer usable, okay, over the long 
period of time. So make sure that you have that particular coverage on your insurance policies. And again, if you need help, my booth is right next door here. Grab a card, give me a call. I'll be happy to review that for you. And I said three things, right? So that means I owe you one more, right? Value added, right? We having fun yet? All right. All right. All right. Number three. Um, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Okay, that is in Proverbs. When I talk about value added, when I talk about the billions of dollars that we provide to the local economy, on average, and I have to go back, on average, we generally provide about a million dollars a day to this local community. And that's through the efforts of life insurance, and health insurance, uh, things along those lines. So if you have questions regarding those particular products, um, we can help you. You'd be surprised that those that need it don't want to have that conversation. It is not a conversation that we can have in public. We'll have a private conversation behind closed doors where the information remains in that space. Um, and as far as economic development, there's no better place do that but to protect and to plan uh, for our future. Number one, we're all going to go, okay? We're all going to go and hopefully we retire before we go. So the two things I'll tell you, and I'm going to add one more since we're having such a great day, right? Such a lively crowd, I'll add one more, okay? Value add. Value add. So we plan for our retirement, right? We also have to plan for that final breath that we take, okay? So that's the last piece of value that, that I'll give you guys. I won't brag about me because I'm just part of the community. It's not about me, folks. It's about you. And it's about what we can do to make sure that we sustain our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. And if you have some questions, The idea of a high tech center on US 1 utilizing the RR railroad property? I'm, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the high tech center for the railroad property. We do have the new community redevelopment agency that's focused on two areas the US 1 corridor and the historic west side neighborhood. And we have a group that meets every month at Hotty Coffee at 6.30 on the second Thursday of the month. Uh, business owners talk about redeveloping US-1. We've had some success, uh, not with CRA funds, but success in helping businesses redevelop property with uh, uh, helping uh, Dr. Alani just with information and uh, doing the Brilliant Center and the uh, working with uh, Realtor Charlotte Smith and uh, the Dollar General folks to uh, revitalize a property that had been a 1950s era motel. It's now a Dollar General with a very pleasing aesthetic. And some other properties uh, have redeveloped Gulfstream Glass. And so uh, we're looking to continue that effort with uh, redeveloping US-1 property. That was the only card that came up for this time. Do you have any other comments? Just to add that, I, I think we have an opportunity to build out some commercial development around the airport. Um, we need to focus on the infrastructure at the airport. I've talked with Pam and Khaled and, and Tony and the, and the commissioners, and I'm invested in building out the business there and setting the groundwork for further growth. Um, there's a significant opportunity to attract aviation businesses from around the state. Aviation makes up about 7% of US GDP, but it's somewhere between 8.5% and 10% of Florida's GDP. Um, aviation overall, uh, the DOT did a study, I think their last official study is from 2015, and it uh, had about a $1.4 billion impact on Florida's economy. So it's significant. 
and this is a great area to attract businesses to. It's a little bit difficult to do it now because we need some infrastructure improvements to help bring some of those businesses in. But I think we offer the airport a solid anchor operation to help draw some other commercial operations in. And with a, with a focus on commercial development there, we can attract higher tech, higher skilled, higher paying jobs to the community that benefits everybody. And this is just last one last thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, one of the main things as a business owner here is, is that we talk about, and it was mentioned earlier, we talk about hiring qualified candidates. Um, I just met, just being at this meeting, and this is what economic development is really about, and that's not just about money, it's about relationships, it's about health, it's about you know making contact. And I just met James Alvarado over here from Career Source, and I've heard about him and what they do. So you guys, before you leave, check out your booths here. You may be surprised at what you learn. And also, I got a good friend back here on the corner, Ms. Conrad, uh, with SCORE. She helps out a lot of folks. Got another buddy back there with Daytona State. And I got another buddy back there. So I got a lot of buddies here. <laughs> so just want to thank everybody. And they have some awesome coasters, too. So, and then you can use those coasters for your beer. <laughs> so we're good. All right. All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. We'll see you in August at the next meeting. We're not until August. Thank you.